Hi, I'm YJ, and in this video, I'm going to go through exactly what you need to do to apply for a national fellowship or award this particular year. In my channel, I have a series about what to do if you're planning long term and applying a few years from now, but this video is about what to do right now. A little bit of a disclaimer, I run a web development and product design company. The web development company is responsible for having built and maintaining the Mitchell Scholarship website and the Mitchell Scholarship application system. I do not review any application that anyone submits. We only go and fix problems and update systems. So I just wanted to make sure to have that disclaimer. National fellowships and awards are amazing. There are many types of fellowships. There's the Mitchell Scholarship, which I did. There's the Loose Scholars Program, which I also did. There's the Fulbright uh, Research Grant Teaching uh, Fulbright. There's the Gates Cambridge in England. There's Rhodes. There's Marshall. There's Schwarzman in Beijing. They offer an unparalleled experience that allows you to go abroad, to get an additional degree, to meet lifelong friends who are highly motivated and doing very interesting things in every type of field. If you are fortunate enough to receive one, then you should be incredibly grateful for all the people who've supported you. You should know that people recognize and appreciate your work. But I want to make sure you know that even if you do not get a national fellowship, that it's not the end of the world. There are so many people I know who have gone on to do amazing work, who've gone on to be brilliant in their own fields, and they might not have been fellowship recipients. So don't stress out about not getting the award. Because you're the type of person to want to apply, I already know that you have big aspirations and big goals for yourself. The first thing I want to review is what to do about recommendations. You want recommendations ahead of time, early, from people who know you well, people you've done research with, people who understand you as a good student, a great student, and have some perspective about what you do outside of the classroom. You want to get recommendations from somebody who can say, this is one of the best students I've ever had, or this is a student who is going to do big things in society in the future. You want someone who's in your corner, who you're going to reach out to year in, year out as you develop your successful career. You want somebody who knows you well. So hopefully you've done enough to get to that point with a handful of folks. There are other things that you can do to make sure that when the professor or advisor or administrator or mentor somewhere is writing a recommendation for you, that you're making it extremely easy for them. You want to be able to have a folder, a physical folder that has everything that you do written out in it. So this includes, but is not limited to, a paper that writes out what's in the folder, a checklist for your recommender, a personal statement that they can read that has your entire narrative written out. And it's okay in this moment if it's a draft. If you're, let's say, at the beginning of summer, late spring, um, handing them this kind of portfolio. You want to have a thorough list and descriptions of activities that you've done in reverse chronological order. It's kind of like an elongated CV or resume that has your role in whatever you were doing, the organization that the role is connected to, time periods related to when you were doing that work, and then a paragraph description of everything you had done in that particular role. You also want to include a document that has expectations for each. In this particular fellowship application, you're going to write a 500 word recommendation. In this, it's going to be a thousand words, right? You want to be clear about what the actual standards and expectations are for each, and you want to make sure 
that they know exactly what they're getting into. Maybe the reviewer knows you to be their best student in an academic context, and maybe they don't know everything that you're doing outside of school. So this allows them to dive in to all the other things that interest you outside of school that, again, is somewhat related to your interests. It allows them to create their own narrative about who you are as a person, who you are as a future successful individual in the world. The other thing you want to include is the one-page resume. I have templates written out and accessible at nationalfellowship.com. You can subscribe there to access all the documentation so that it'll save you maybe a day or two of work and organizing. That'll allow you to package the materials in a way that makes it, again, very easy for your potential recommender to open up your packet when they're when they're ready to write a recommendation for you and they will see exactly what they need to do the reason why packaging it is important is let's say this professor has gotten other requests in years past or they have requests this year from other students if they're looking at your packet and it's all organized it's all clear it's very easy for them to use they don't have to go and dig through a bunch of emails and find that versus a student who's just emailing who's sending attachments haphazardly who might have dropped off a personal statement to the office that professor is going to see that student as a little chaotic, a little messier. This student is not making it easy, whereas you are making it very easy for them. Think about it that way. They're going to be, they're going to have a little bit more of a favorable perspective about who you are. So you absolutely want to make it easy for your recommenders. In my experience, I package things as neatly as possible because I also knew that. I was requesting recommendations and write-ups and referrals for jobs, for fellowship applications, for graduate school. And there were professors who were pushing out 40 letters for me in a given year. It was, that I think was certainly overboard, but this packaging made it easy. Of course, you want a physical packaging and then you want that emulated in digital form so that there's one email that they can go to with a link that has folders of everything that they need that is effectively identical to the content that you give them that's hard paper. This is incredibly tedious, but it's really important that you're able to make it super easy for the people who are trying to support you. Again, go to nationalfellowship.com to access this material. There will be other content there where I will be reviewing my successful applications. I'll be tediously reviewing line by line my personal statement. And just so you know, you can access personal statements that other students have won in the past at your institution. I'm sure most fellowship offices have folders of these, but what I'm gonna be doing at nationalfellowship.com is actively going line by line and explaining why I structured my essays in the way that I had. And hopefully you can glean from that ways in which you can articulate your own story more effectively. You clearly have a different story than my own, but this might help you formulate the structure better. The next thing that you need to think about now when you're watching this video is many fellowship applicants will have personal websites. Why? You have all your materials elsewhere. You have your listed activities in the application systems. You have all of those. The reason why you want to make a personal website now is there might be a reviewer or a fellowship selection committee person who's looking at your application, sees the optional website link, and just clicks on it. That website link can make you a candidate that has more depth than other students who do not. Some students are listing out all their activities. Other students might have videos and media and high resolution imagery of the work that they did abroad in Southern Venezuela as I had. If you have something like that, then imagery and media can help shape who you are more effectively than words sometimes. Fellowship applications are incredibly competitive, so you wanna give yourself an edge wherever possible. Now, why do you want a website now? It takes a little bit of time 
for Google to know that your website exists and to bring your website up in the search rankings when somebody Googles your name. That isn't something that happens overnight. It usually happens over a period of time. So you wanna make a website now, put as much content as you, you're comfortable with on the website. And when fall or winter rolls around, when selections take place, if somebody Googles your name, they're immediately able to see one of the Google search results as you. They click on it, they're going to be able to dive in deeper. Now, what else do you include in your personal website? You can have writings, you can have blog posts about your perspectives on current events, on any topic you're really interested in. If most applicants are going to have a niche interest, I recommend everyone write your perspective about that niche interest and let that be an exercise in helping to market yourself further, not just for national fellowships, but for your career. When I was a fellowship applicant, I didn't have a personal website, but that's because it was a little bit over a decade ago. If I had the option at that point, I absolutely would have done it. But one thing I did have was I ran a public health nonprofit and that public health nonprofit had a website. It featured a lot of the work that we were doing. And I know at the time, fellowship selection committees were clicking on the website. So I know that it can actually have an impact. As I said before, I run this web design and product development company. One of our products is called Publit. Publit is a website builder meant for personal websites. We originally made it for PhD students because most PhD students are in a hyper competitive environment where there are very few tenure track positions and they are trying to differentiate themselves. Each PhD candidate needs a website to highlight their work, their research experiences, their writing, etc. So we originally made it for that, but I realized that personal websites can help entrepreneurs, writers, anyone who's starting a new business, or anyone who's had established businesses, college students who have a lot to share, and personal websites can absolutely give you an edge in the application process. What we aim to do is make personal website building hyper accessible. We want it to take 10 to 15 minutes for you to fully launch a website without having to think about design or development. There are preset templates, you're filling out a form, you're pressing a button, and boom, you have a personal website. We don't want people to be burdened by having to think about laying out different parts of their website, thinking about what's going to look the best versus okay. We want you to get your work out there into the world and we want you to exist online. Fellowship offices are offices at each school that helps review, analyze, supports, selects students at your schools. They might be large offices with multiple staff. They might be a single person, but it's important for you to go and meet these individuals early on. You don't want to go in and bother them, but you wanna go in and introduce yourself and ask good questions about these programs. If you're really not sure where you kind of fit in, it's good to ask and they might have recommendations for you. Of course, you want to have done as much research as possible about what you actually might want. Go in and get their perspective. It can help give you additional answers that might hone where you want to apply. There are so many of these programs. Something you have to understand is even though in your mind, applying to all of them increases your chances of getting one, you have to understand that the fellowship offices at your school, some of whom have to internally select candidates for the school, their selection criteria might not be perfectly aligned with your desire to get one of these. It's best to go into the fellowship offices with an idea of, oh, I'm really interested in technology and Ireland has all these amazing tech companies that are domiciled there, that are growing, and I wanna be at an Irish university so that I can have access to this growing European hub of technology. You want to be very specific about why one fellowship might work out better than another. You could think, oh, well, I wanna get a PhD or an advanced degree 
and Gates Cambridge and Rhodes can set me up for that. You obviously also wanna know statistically what chances you have for each. I'm going to have a specific video about fellowships with which I have familiarity, so look out for those. But in general terms, you wanna know, and these stats exist online, you wanna know what are the chances for me to get a Fulbright to Croatia or a Fulbright to Ecuador versus me getting a Schwarzman scholarship or me applying for a Rhodes. What's that process like and what are the actual chances? You wanna approach the fellowship office at your school with a, a bit of a range of national fellowships that you might have a higher chance of getting versus those that are a little bit more exclusive. Now let's talk about your personal statement. I'm gonna have a review of my own personal statements on nationalfellowship.com. Subscribe to that if you want instant anonymous access. It might make sense for you to access a bunch of successful personal statements of students who've won awards at your institution in the past and also review my videos so that you can see exactly why I structured my narrative story how I wanted to structure it. In general, there are three distinct parts that you need to think about as far as structuring your personal story. One is your past. The middle part is what you did in college. And the last part is what you aspire to do in the future. To give you my example, I'm somebody who grew up in Southern Indiana. My father's a professor, my mother stayed at home. My father got his first tenure track position when I was in my early teens. So I remember a time when we really didn't have much because my father was a graduate student with two kids and a wife. I remember moving around all the time. I was born in Indianapolis. I moved to Bloomington, Eugene, Oregon, Morris, Minnesota, and back to Southern Indiana. Now, some of that is too much information. You don't need to share all of that. But you can help kind of contextualize who you are as a person by referring to bits and pieces of that past. In my personal statements, I usually have said something like, you know, my family was money poor but book rich. That was a very accurate way for me to represent how my family was. We cared deeply about education, addressing kind of where I came from, what the values are in my family, what my values are, and how privileged I feel that we really cared about reading and writing and books and libraries. At Swarthmore, I was a terrible student very early on, but with the help of many professors, I became a much better student. I did a summer research program at Indiana University Medical School. At that time, I was intending to go to, go to medical school. The summer after my sophomore year, I was a doctor's assistant in southern Venezuela in a village that had no road access. What started as a way to bring resources into these villages eventually became a public health nonprofit where we funded some vaccination programs, where we had community health workshops, where we brought dentists into the communities. That happened because I was able to bring a bunch of very hardworking, smart students together at Swarthmore. And my senior year, I was a student body president. During those four years, I was also a varsity track athlete. I had a wide variety of activities I was doing that showed that I had some leadership potential. Then in the personal statement, I laid out what I hoped my future would become. A lot of it was public health related, but I also referred to policymakers in the past that had made my life possible. I was a Medicaid recipient. I went to Head Start. I realized the impact of policy on families like my own, and I care deeply about policy academically as well. Threading these parts together creates a narrative arc that helps reviewers understand me and my candidacy. They could see that I truly cared about what I was doing. They could see that other people supported me in what I was doing. And when they're assessing you as a candidate, what they're ultimately asking is, is this person going to make an impact beyond themselves? Is this person going to make a societal impact somehow, somewhere in some field? So you want to be able to answer that question with an emphatic yes, and you want your story to offer some hints that that might be the case. In this channel, I'm taking what I've learned over the last 15 years, and I'm trying to condense it and share all of it with you. My national fellowship experiences 
were incredibly impactful for me because it allowed me to kind of change course and work on something that I also truly cared about, which is startups. When I started that nonprofit that I referred to before, I felt immense energy and appreciation for taking an idea that was nothing and making it become something, something tangible. That to me was almost magical. And I, at the same time, I knew that I had taken the web, the growth of the web for granted my entire life. And there were two moments that made me realize I should change course. When we launched the Pomone Health, the public health nonprofit's website, we got all sorts of grant money. I was able to meet President Clinton through that. And the other moment was when there was a medical emergency in the villages. And we had, through satellite internet, contacted my home physician and asked him what to do when there is a breech birth and asked him what to do when there was a child with a large, immense gash on his leg. That made me realize how important the internet was. And I realized this is something I want to commit my life to. My experiences abroad in Hanoi, Vietnam as a loose scholar and my experiences in Ireland getting a public health degree and having time to teach myself startup related work in design. I basically was able to shift my trajectory and work on what I love doing. There are thousands of students applying to national fellowships and awards, but the important takeaway is that you'll be able to figure out what your life trajectory might be. You'll be able to imagine and dream your future life. Hopefully, for those who are able to access these programs, you'll be part of a community of long-term friends and highly motivated people who are doing very interesting work in disparate fields all over the world. For those who don't end up being awarded, I want you to know that it's going to be totally fine. I have had friends who've done these programs. I have had friends who haven't. And the whole point is your desire to market yourself more effectively, to apply for these programs, to put yourself out there is enough of an indicator that you truly care about your future. You're going to be just fine. If you have any questions or concerns that aren't answered in all of these videos or on fellowship application websites, etc., just email me. I'll do my best to get back to you or comment in the video and I'll do my best to reply back. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for other videos that dive into the specifics of this and good luck.